Please, if you have your Bible with you, turn with me to 1 Timothy and chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3. While you're finding that, let me say, first of all, a great thank you uh, from me and from my wife and family uh, for the invitation to come and join you for this conference. It's a real joy to be here. We've already enjoyed a delightful few days uh, in Finland, and we trust that God will bless you uh, through uh, the preaching of the word, but also that he will bless us through our fellowship with you. It's lovely especially to see uh, some friends I know from other places as well. So thank you to you all for making the effort to join us this evening. I'm going to read from chapter 3 of 1 Timothy, and I'm going to begin in verse 1, but that's not the beginning of the sequence of Paul's thought. He's writing here to a man that he describes as his son in the faith, Timothy a man to whom Paul himself had first preached the gospel, a man that he is now sending to do the work of an evangelist and in some sense a pastor helping to establish churches of Jesus Christ. And he starts to give him instructions as to how he's to think, how he is to act, what he is to, uh, what principles he is to work on, how he is to put these things into practice. He's talked already in chapter 2 about prayer. He's talked about the roles of men and women in the church. And now in chapter 3, he begins, This is a faithful saying. If a man desires the position of a bishop or an elder, he desires a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetous, one who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest, being puffed up with pride, he fall into the same condemnation as the devil." Moreover, he must have a good testimony among those who are outside, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Likewise, deacons must be reverent, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy for money, holding the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience. But let these also first be tested. Then let them serve as deacons, being found blameless. Likewise, their wives must be reverent, not slanderers, temperate, faithful in all things. Let deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their own houses well. For those who have served well as deacons obtain for themselves a good standing and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. And now Paul summarises these things from verse 14. These things, the things that have gone before, These things I write to you, though I hope to come to you shortly. But if I am delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in glory. Let's pray once more. Eternal God, most high and most holy, we come again to you because you alone are that living and true God, the God who has made a people for yourself who has called sinners out of darkness into your marvellous light. And we pray, O God, that having done that for many of us here this evening, you would do it for those who are still outside of your kingdom, and that we may understand, not just in our minds, but from our hearts and in our very experience, what it means to be part of the church of the living God. We pray these mercies and commit ourselves to your care, In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. 
What is the church of God? What is a church of God? Slightly different, but both important questions. Important, not least for this reason, that God the Father sent his Son to suffer and to die in order to ransom or redeem his church. That the Son of God took flesh and blood and loving his people, he laid down his life for them in order that they might belong to him and be his people. He rose on their behalf and he now reigns and prays for them. And the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead. That Spirit sustained the Son in his humanity in the work that he did. And he now indwells the people whom God through Christ has redeemed. And he blesses them and he works in them so that they show the marks of true believers. That's why it's important to know the answers to the questions, what is the church of God and what is a church of God? Because if the church are the children of God the Father, if the church is the bride of the Lord Jesus Christ, if the church is the home of the Holy Spirit, then every single one of us needs to think carefully and reverently about what the church is and what a church is as the Bible, the Word of God, defines the church. But we live in an age that is quickly impatient with distinctions. As soon as we start to to talk about precise truth, and we start to draw lines that divide one thing from another, people can get very easily frustrated with us. They begin to call us uh, perhaps bigoted or, or fanatics. We are the people who take the Bible too seriously, the people who are trying too hard. There was a, a Christian in my country many years ago who was once asked, Sir, why are you so precise? What's your problem? Why are you so precise? And his answer was, because, sir, I serve a precise God. And we serve a God who cares about the answers to these questions because they are his people about whom these questions are being asked. And we cannot afford to be careless or confused about the answers. Even amongst those who call themselves or even are true believers in Jesus Christ. People can quickly become impatient when we start to discuss what is a biblical church. And that is a tragedy. Because it is vital that we, if we are Christians, know the privileges, the responsibilities, the opportunities, the duties and the blessings that come from belonging to the church of God and a particular church of God. What it means to be joined to Jesus Christ himself by faith and in him to be joined together with those who have become our brothers and sisters in Christ. And if you're here this evening and you are not a Christian... It is vital that you understand what are the privileges and the blessings and the opportunities that come with being part of the true church of God. Because outside ultimately is only darkness and misery and inside is life and joy. Our age, and I don't think Finland is any different from the part of the world where I come from, not so far away, there is also a, a, a rampant, a, 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 even a, a rabid, a, a sort of a mad individualism. Everybody thinks that they can do everything by themselves alone. Some societies, this is more true than others, and at different times in different places. I remember several years ago now, and I don't think it lasted long, uh, an advert for the American army. And it featured a single person, a soldier, 
with a pack on his back and a helmet on his head and rifle in his hand, and he was running, running, running across the wilderness all by himself. And after a while, the tag came up on the advertisement, an army of one. Now, you know what happens to an army of one, don't you? It loses every single time because there's only one of them. And yet that is so often how we like to see ourselves. We are an army of one. I see myself as isolated and separate from other Christians. I don't want anybody else, perhaps. I don't need anybody else. I don't want to be accountable to people. I don't want to be answerable to anybody. I don't want to live close to anybody else. And there is so much that we lose by thinking like that. And so much that we would gain by a right understanding, not only of what we are in ourselves in Jesus Christ, but what we are together as the church of the living God. And so we need to make sure that we do not misunderstand or ignore or dismiss or reject what God himself says about the church that he loves, that his son has redeemed and in which his spirit dwells. We need to make sure that we clear away flawed understandings limited appreciation, incomplete grasp of this truth. And yet, even in a, a conference like this, we can only begin to begin to begin to scratch the surface. We're setting out some of the broad strokes, but we are only beginning to study out what is the church of Jesus Christ considering what is her identity and what is her activity. We are, if you like, setting out some foundation stones, but there is always much to build on top. And so we need to see how we, if we are Christians, as living stones, are built together, cemented together with the blood of Jesus Christ to become the temple of the living God. So let's try this evening, as we begin to look at these topics, to try and answer those questions. What is the church and what is a church? So what is the church? Now some wrong ideas are not particularly dangerous ideas. Thank you, brother. Some wrong ideas are not particularly dangerous ideas. Uh, suppose uh, that I was uh, involved in a horse race and I confuse a race horse with a cart horse. Now, depending on the outcome of the race, it's probably not that dangerous to make the mistake that this is a cart horse and I've entered it in a race against a race horse. I might find my pride dented. Maybe I lose a prize at the end of the race, but it's not the end of the world. But what about when it comes to a battle? What if I confuse a cart horse with a war horse? and I ride into battle on a cart horse against those who are coming against me with war horses. Then my misunderstanding, my confusion, my wrong answer to the question, what kind of horse is this, is going to bring my life into danger and will probably mean that I in fact die. A wrong answer in that respect can be crippling or even fatal. And the same is true if we come up with the wrong answers to the question, what is the church of God? This is not a light question to ask or to answer. The wrong answer can be crippling to your soul and even fatal to your eternal well-being. So we need to understand some of the things that a church is not. Because a church is not a building. Now we talk sometimes about going to church. And we often mean, I'm going to the place where the church meets. But the building is not the church. We're told over and over in both the Old and the New Testaments of our Bible that God does not dwell in buildings made with hands. And so God is not tied to any particular place. If the church were to meet here, or outside, 
or in the woods, or in a home, or in a hut, or anywhere else, it could still be a church because it has nothing to do with the building, the structure in which it meets, or which it does not have to meet in. So coming to church is not necessarily about coming to a place, even though the church would normally meet in a place. The church is not a profession. The people talk in Finland about entering the church the way some people talk about entering the police or entering the civil service. Oh, I became a lawyer. Oh, I became a priest. It's, it's, it's another choice. What was daddy? Well, daddy was a priest. What are you going to be? I'm going to be a priest like daddy. What about you? I'm going to be a welder. Why? Well, daddy was a welder. Uh, it's, it's a succession. It's a profession. It's, a, it's an option for work that we do, not according to the Bible. It is not a profession. It's not a club for religious people or for moral people or for good people or for nice people. So we leave all the, 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 the really bad people outside. We leave the people who really don't fit outside. And we dress up nicely and we smile politely and we're the church because we talk about God. It's not a collection of families. The church is something far bigger than family ties, blood lines. It's not an organisation for doing good. A lot of people, when they, they think about the church, they think about soup kitchens or taking care of the sick, taking care of the needy. Some of those things may be part of the life of the church, but the church is not just a sort of religious social service organisation. And a church is not even a series of meetings even though a church does meet. You cannot say that just because you've come to meetings of a church that you are part of that church. You see, all of these ideas may have some grains of truth in them, but most of them are external only. They're missing the vital reality. They're missing the spiritual substance of the church of Jesus Christ. And if we are to answer the question correctly, what is the church? We need to look beyond those external things and understand what is at the very heart of the church's nature. What is her identity? How she begins? What she really is? Not as men see her, but as God himself defines her. And that's why we read from 1 Timothy chapter 3. These things I write to you, Timothy, though I hope to come to you shortly. Paul's saying, I I'll see you soon, I hope, but here's a letter ahead of time. If I'm delayed, I write to you so that you may know in advance, in effect, how you ought to conduct yourself, the kind of behavior, the kind of principles to be worked out in the house of God which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Paul says, Timothy, this is so important that I'm going to write to you just in case I'm delayed so that in all your dealings with the church of the living God, you may conduct yourself in the right way. Now, if you are using... Uh, an ordinary translation, you may not realize that there is an important, quite technical word hidden in that translation. A technical term, the ecclesia, the church of the living God, the gathered assembly who have been called out and called together by this God. And that idea has its roots in the Old Testament. I won't go through all the, the possible references, but you'll find them, for example, in Exodus chapter 35 and verse 1, Numbers chapter 10, Deuteronomy 9 and verse 10, Psalm 22 and verse 22, where Christ speaking, or the, the, the prophets speaking, and Christ's words, as it were, being he heard, saying, I have declared your name in the midst of the, the congregation, or the assembly. In the Old Testament, the word is a kahal. In the New Testament, it's the ecclesia. It is the gathered assembly, a congregation of people. It is not static. 
But it is dynamic. It is a vibrant, vital, distinctive and dynamic assembly. A group that is summoned by God himself to worship God and to carry out warfare on behalf of God. Worship and warfare. And so the congregation, the assembly, the church gathers. I should point out, because I won't make this point very often, but we must remember when using that kind of language that the New Testament church does not fight battles with weapons made by man's hands. The weapons of our warfare are spiritual, but the principle is the same. Worship and warfare. And that's just what we're finding here in 1 Timothy chapter 3. This group of the living God, called out by God, called to Him, assembling themselves together, gathering together as the expression of their relationship to the living God, that they may worship Him and carry out His works in the world. So what can we say about this church as it's either stated or implied in this passage? Well, first of all, it is summoned. The church is summoned. Now, it's not a a flash mob. Do you know what a flash mob is? Okay, it's in in the age of um, uh, social media, uh, you can arrange so that A group of people with a common aim all arrive together in the same place at the same time and do something pretty impressive. It's the sort of situation you might see it on YouTube or or wherever else it might be and you're in in a crowded railway station and all of a sudden someone stands up and starts singing the Hallelujah Chorus. Everybody goes, what's, what's wrong with them? And then over here, there's all of a sudden four men stand up. And, Hallelujah! And, and then somebody else on this side, and somebody else on that side. And it's a flash mob. They've been gathered together. They've been summoned by means of social media. Someone's come up with this lovely idea of singing the Hallelujah chorus in the middle of a railway station. Is that like the church? Do we just get a few text messages that go around and say, let's get together sometime? Is it a human idea? No, and it's not an accident. It's not just that we happen to have some of the same ideas and some of the same convictions, and we've kind of rolled together. The church of God is summoned by God himself. It is a people who have been called out of the world, out of the sinful, lost dark world by the voice of God that they have heard not just with their ears but in their very souls and God has said to them with power come to me and they have come together to God they are as it were clustered around him the church is a God summoned group but it's also then a united group There is one church, there is one shepherd and one flock. Now it may have different folds and we'll look at that when we talk about a church. But in the grandest sense, all of God's redeemed people are the church across time and space. They have one ransom paid for them. The the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ has been shed on their behalf. They have one captain and they stand as one army, though they have made different, may have different regiments and companies. They are one people and all of those people everywhere are defined by the same beliefs and the same behavior. They are united Whether they live a hundred years ago or a thousand years ago or ten minutes ago. Whether they're in Finland or in England or in America or in Africa or in Asia or Australia. They are united by the same truths that come from the same God. And they believe those truths and they behave accordingly. So that we can come here having not met most of you before and say... Hello, brother. Hello, sister. And gather in the presence of one Father, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's vital. 
to understand that that believing and that behaving go together. Do you ever read one of those stories in the media uh, where uh, it might be a politician who calls themselves a devout Christian? Uh, and, and the media would love to say, devout Christian Mr. So-and-so is discovered to be having a relationship with his secretary. We had a situation recently as part of the political scene in the UK. And you could almost hear people rubbing their hands because a man who'd set himself up as a good Christian family man had been found to be indulging in all kinds of sexual sin. The priest who's indulging in pornography or having a, an illicit sexual relationship with somebody. The good Christian who lies and cheats and steals in his business. What's the problem with that? That's not Christianity. It doesn't matter what label you stick on somebody. If they don't believe what God has said and they do not behave in accordance with those beliefs, it's not real Christianity. It doesn't matter if it calls itself a priest. It doesn't matter if it calls itself a church. If it has no relation, if it is not united to God in this truth and by a life that ties up with that truth, it is not Christianity. Which means that if you are here this evening and you do not believe what God says about sin and salvation and you are not living in the light of those truths, it does not matter what label you or anybody else has stuck on you. You are not yet a Christian. Because Christians are summoned out of the world by God, to God, united by the things that they believe and the way that they behave, and therefore distinct. They are clearly defined and definable by their relationship to God and to each other. Christians often called at the polite end of the scale strange, weird, outsiders. They don't fit in. The, the social pressure that was part of Christianity in the, the New Testament is, is something that we ourselves know. People want us to think like everybody else thinks and walk like everybody else walks and do those things. But Christianity is not simply going with the flow. It is not simply traveling with the current of the world. It is those who are marked out by their attachment to God and to each other. So that the Lord Jesus Christ himself could say when they told him, look, your mother and your brothers are outside and they're calling for you. He says, see these people? This is my family. Those who hear the word of God and do it. This is the great tie that binds. This is the essential reality. A recognisable body that is identifiable in clear terms. So, for example, in 2 Corinthians and chapter 6, the apostle speaks there in this language. What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God, as God has said. I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. I will be a father to you and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. If you're a Christian... It does put a distance between you and the world. Because you stop wanting what everybody else wants. And you stop walking, living the way everybody else walks and lives. And you don't go to the places where once you used to go. And you don't speak the way you used to speak. And your reactions and your desires and your appetites have changed. Not from the outside in, but from the inside out. You no longer belong in the way that you used to, to this present evil age, to use the apostles language. But you belong to God and so you start to look and to sound different. You're separate, separated to God. He's called you to himself. 
but then it is an ordered group. It's the household of God. He's in charge. The church is not a place where we make things up as we go along. It's not a democracy. We don't send out a few sheets of paper and ask, what would you like us to do? And how would you like us to behave? And, And what do you think would be a good idea? God is the Father. Christ Jesus is the eldest Son. He is the one who administers the Father's rule in the household. It is not a free-for-all. We don't get to decide how the household of God works. That is God's divine prerogative. We are those who once outside have been brought in and now enjoy the privileges and the blessings within the God-ordained structures of his household. It is ordered by him. It is cared for by him. It is protected by him. It is governed by him. For those of us who are here with with our children, you, you will see us often, very often probably, in the course of these next three or four days, we say, no, 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 stop to come back. Come back from where you're going. Think about what you're doing. I don't want you to go here. I don't want you to go there. I want you to sit here now. I want you to think about these things. I want you to slow down. Don't go that high up that tree. Don't go that far. What are we doing? We're ordering our households for the safety, protection, blessing, maturing of those who are under our care. I tell you, if I took a a poll of my children to find out what they think they should be doing over the course of the next few hours, things would get pretty disastrous pretty quickly. It is my responsibility as father, together with my wife in the family dynamic in this case, to establish and enforce the rules that work for the blessing of the household. And so it is in the household of God. There is one father over all. He establishes and enforces his structures. And that's why it's not just a summoned group, not just a united group, not just a distinct group, and not just a well-ordered group, but a blessed group. Truly and lastingly happy. Because it's a group that exists in relation, not to God as an idea, but to the living God. To the God of heaven and earth. To the triune Lord of all. To the God who has made all things and who sustains all things. Because it is not a human idea. Because it is not a human construction. It is not centred on or deriving from human notions. You remember in the Old Testament, in the book of the Psalms, and also through the prophet Jeremiah, the complaint and even in sometimes the scorn comes out. You know what happens to those who serve dead idols? They are like them. They are as dead as they are. The idols have ears, but they cannot hear. They have hands, but they cannot act. Feet, but they cannot move. Isaiah makes fun of somebody who knocks down a tree, uses some to make a fire to keep his bones warm, and then carves the rest out in order to set it up and worship it as his God. But he says you need to make it pretty with gold. You actually need to chain it down, because your God can't even look after himself in case someone takes your gold idol away. You might say, well, we're a bit more sophisticated than that. Are you? Do you have any idols? Who do you trust? Where do you find your security, your prosperity, your blessing? Is your idol in your reputation? Is your idol your bank account? Is it the big home or the good job? or the wife, or the husband, or the the model family, or whatever else it may be, that you think that's where you find your happiness, that's where you find your security, that's what is my blessing. The Christian says, no, we are blessed because God is God and our God. We belong to him. The Lord of heaven and earth is our protector, our redeemer, 
our governor. We are belonging to Jesus Christ because we have been purchased by his blood and the Holy Spirit has taken up residence within our hearts and we enjoy a relationship with him. He says of us, in some ways in a far higher way than he ever said to anyone before, I will be your God and you shall be my people. This is the church. This is the church. Wherever you find her, in every place and across time, this is the church of the living God. A people called out of the world by God to himself with others. And you might say, well, it sounds lovely. But what does it look like in real life? How do you get down from the church to a church? Because if we are Christians here, I hope that we are not just part of the church, but part of a church. And that is sometimes not quite as neat, and the lines are not quite as clean as they may first appear. So how does this work in practice? What does it look like in time and space? What is a church? Because the church is always seen in time and space as a church. Let me offer you a case study. And that case study, that example, is the church at Corinth. The church at Corinth. And we're going to ask and answer three questions about how the church of God came to expression in Corinth as a church. The first question we need to ask and to answer is what were these people by nature? What were they like, as it were, when God found them? Well, we can answer that question by reading from 1 Corinthians in chapter 6. This is verse 9. Do not be deceived. I'm breaking in in the middle of the verse. Two Corinthians, sorry, 1 Corinthians, the first letter to Corinthian church, chapter 6, verse 9. Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God and such were some of you. That's what these people were by nature. You see, God did not come to the good people. And he didn't come to the moral people. And he didn't come to the nice people. And he didn't come to the people who had sorted themselves out and tidied themselves up and looked nice and neat and clean on the outside with well-ordered lives who knew how to live respectably before other people. He came to people who were full of wickedness within and without. Some of them probably looked quite respectable themselves. You can be a very respectable looking drunkard, can't you? You can get on with life during the day, but it's what happens at night. When you've shut the door and everybody else is away. You could be an idolater, worshipping your family. Worshipping your bank balance, worshipping your car, and still be applauded by society. You could be a covetous man or woman, wanting more and more and more. And the world calls it go-getting. And they appoint you higher and higher up in the company, because you're the person who can make everybody else rich. And Paul puts those people together with the fornicators, those who are indulging in sexual relationships with people who aren't married, with the adulterers, men stealing other men's wives and women stealing other women's husbands, with the homosexuals and the sodomites, with the revilers, the thieves, the drunkards, the extortionists. And he says nobody who lives like that has any part in God's kingdom. If that is your settled state, if that is your nature, then you are outside of the 
church. You don't belong in God's kingdom in that state. Whatever background, whatever range of backgrounds, all of these people were marked by sin and wickedness. You know, don't you, that Jesus did not come to congratulate the moral on their morality. <laughs> But he came to save sinners from their sins, to call them to repent and to believe in him. The church then does not begin with the nice people and they just get folded together. By nature, the church is a group of sinners of all kinds. But then what happened by grace? What were these people by nature? Rotten, dead sinners. But what happened by grace? In 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 11, Paul says, And such were some of you. That's what you were, and it's what you really were. That wasn't make-believe, that wasn't pretend, you weren't going through the motions, you were sunk in sin, but you are no longer sunk in in sin and we know what changed because a man called Luke tells us in Acts chapter 18 and verse 8 because Crispus the ruler of the synagogue believed on the Lord with all his household and many of the Corinthians including all these kinds of people hearing believed and were baptized now what did they hear that when they believed caused them to be baptised and made them effectively part of the church of Jesus Christ. They heard the gospel. They heard the good news that God, the holy God, in his mercy and kindness and goodness, has sent his son into the world to suffer and to die in the place of the ungodly. That he can wash the foulest clean that he can take away all the guilt and the shame of our transgressions and he can bring us to himself and that's what happened in Corinth by grace to a group of wicked empty spiritually dark men and women God came with spiritual power and they heard the truth and they believed in Jesus Christ and they were baptised, not in order to become Christians, but as a testimony to God and to men that they were no longer dead in their sins, but had died with Jesus Christ and had risen again to a new life in him. God called them through his word. His spirit worked in their hearts and made them alive together with Jesus Christ who once were dead in trespasses and sins and so they identified themselves with Jesus of Nazareth, their crucified and risen Lord by being baptised as those who had been washed, those who had been sanctified, those who had been justified by the work of the Holy Spirit in their hearts. And what did they become? It's a very simple answer. It's in the first few verses of the first letter to the Corinthians. This random group of sinners who heard God speaking to them through the gospel of his son Jesus Christ and under the influence of the Holy Spirit had their hearts renewed and so put their faith in this Jesus and now Paul can write to them, Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified, set apart in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. A saints doesn't mean high grade Christians. Saints means everyone who belongs to God. And these who once were full of sin can now be defined as the church of God at Corinth, set apart in Christ Jesus and called God's set apart people. A church with all kinds of problems. A church that is still struggling with confusion about certain truths with how that truth works out in life. 
but a church that is sincere. There is imperfection. There is temptation. It's why Paul is writing to them. Because like with Timothy, he's saying you need to know what you believe. And you need to know how you behave. But this so much is still true. That in Christ Jesus, you have become God's. He has called you. And the Spirit opened your ears to hear his call. And you have come out of the world to God. And that means that you are his church. And Paul can write to the church at Corinth. Just like he could have written to the church at Tampere. Just like he could have written to the church that meets in Jakobstad. Just like he could have written to the church that meets in my town of Crawley. There's a group of people there who used to be dirty, rotten scoundrels. And would be still if God in his grace and mercy had not spoken the truth into their hearts, brought them to himself and designated them his people. You see, that's what any local church is. That's what a church is. It's a, a, a motley group, a, a very imperfect, still in many ways, ugly group. I'm sorry, I can't dress it up for us. <laughs> You only got to look around a church and you say, yep, that's what we are. <laughs> These must have really, we'll talk to him later. <laughs> they know. They know of their own hearts. And they know the hearts of God's people. That we are sinners saved by grace. The work in us has begun wonderfully, marvelously, really and truly. And by grace we have heard and believed the good news about our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. And though we are not yet perfect, we are growing in the grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ. We're getting it. We're understanding what God has said. And it's making a difference in the way that we live. And so we gather together to worship him. And we gather together to carry out his works in the earth. As an expression of the fact... That we now have a new relationship to God in Christ. And that relationship has brought us not just into relationship with God. But has joined us in Christ one to another. And we identify ourselves with the body of Jesus in one place. As we travel together toward the glory that God has appointed for his people. That's true of the whole church, and it's true of every local church specifically. Seen as individuals, we are those who heard, believed, and were baptised. And we now identify ourselves as God's people here, or there, or there, or wherever it may be. So I have two questions for you as I close this evening. The first is this, are you actually part of the church? Not the kind of definitions that the world likes to use, not the mere externals, not the appearances, not the religious club, not the group of people who sprinkle their babies and gather them together. Not the people who just happen to meet in this town or in that village on a particular time on a particular day. Not that you go to a particular building then. Not that you've joined the club. Not that you go through the motions. You're not committed to men. But that you have heard the good news from heaven. About a saviour from your sins. And when you have heard... You have not been able to rest until you have laid hold upon Jesus Christ for yourself. And you know him. And in knowing him, you know God. And in knowing God, you have eternal life. That's what it means, my friend, to be part of the church. And if that is not yet true of you, then I plead with you this evening, do not fool yourself. <coughs> Do not imagine, do not pretend, do not think that you are safe in life and in death because of some merely external 
attachment to someone or something or someones. It is faith in Christ that saves sinners like us from hell and secures for us a place in heaven. You must be part of God's church. There's no point being part of man's. It will not save you in that sense. Have you heard this good news? And have you responded by repenting of your particular sins and putting your faith in Jesus Christ to save you? That you've acknowledged that even if your sins were not the particular sins of the men and women of Corinth, that nevertheless you are a sinner great in word and in deed, by nature and in life, and that you have needed a saviour. And you have found one in Jesus Christ and in him only. And having trusted, you have been washed from your sins and you are now clean. And God has declared you in his sight to be righteous because of the righteousness of Jesus that has been put to your account. And you have been sanctified. You have been set apart to God. You are his and he is yours. Because if you are not part of the church, then you are not on your way to heaven, but to hell. And until you repent and believe, you remain lost in the darkness. And I would be no true preacher and no friend to your soul if I did not warn you that that were the case. Are you part of the church? And if you are, are you part of a church? Because that's what should always follow. Where are my people? Where do I go? What do I do next? What more do I believe? How do I behave? You see, this great mass of redeemed sinners always comes into concrete, real, local expression in the local body of Jesus Christ, a particular church where the people whom God has called out of the world to himself gather together to help, love, encourage, bless, teach one another so that they can make their way through this world on their way to that Mount Zion, which is above. A distinct and definable group. So that people can say, you know all those weirdos? They're all together. We have a phrase in English, birds of a feather flock together. Christians flock together. They're the sheep of the shepherd. They hear his voice. They want to be with one another. They love and serve God and each other. And that love and that service spills over to the blessing of those who are around. They become the church of the living God, which is the pillar and the ground of the truth. They are God's means of holding up and displaying his glory before a watching world. My friends, if you're a true Christian, your weirdness is your boast. <laughs> People say to you, man, you're one of those weird ones. You've got no idea. <laughs> I am a blood-bought child of the living God. Christ is mine. Heaven is mine. I have an eternal weight of glory which is laid up for me. When I gather together with those other weird people every Sunday, we are enjoying something of what heaven will be. I have left this... This is worse than I thought. Oh, no, no, no. This is better than you can imagine. This is what it means to be part of God's people. That's why you need to know what it looks like. And that's why you need to know what it involves. And that's why you need to know whether you are on the outside still looking in. Or whether you've come to possess the blessings and the privileges and the opportunities. And facing the challenges and the duties of what it means to be God's people in this world. You can search through the entire New Testament. And with two possible exceptions... The thief on the cross and the Ethiopian eunuch. Every other person that you find in the New Testament who puts their faith in Jesus Christ is part of a local church. That's just normal in the Bible. 
That's where you find Christians. They get together to worship God and to work for him. But you've got to get it right. You need to be part of the church. Faith in Jesus Christ. And then become part of a church. Joining with others of the same faith. To live to the praise of the glory of the God who loves you and has saved you through his son. You need to know what it means to belong to the church of God. I pray you will come to know that. And then what it means to belong to a church with all the sweet blessings and privileges that come with it. Amen. Let's pray together. O oh God, our God, we come and bow before you this evening because you are the great God of all, the living and true Lord. And you, because of your grace, because of your mercy, because of your favour toward sinners like us, have made yourself to be our God, our Father. You, O oh God, are our all in all. And we pray that those who are still dead in their trespasses and sins may know you in Christ Jesus, repenting and believing, and so being drawn out of the darkness into your marvellous light, that there would be others who gather together in the churches represented here and in other churches established in this and other countries who will know you, love you, worship you and work for you and seek in all things to bring honour and glory to your great name. So, our Father, hear our cries as we thank you for all that you are in yourself and all that you are to us and all that you have done for us in and through Jesus Christ. We offer our prayers and our praises in his holy name and by the Spirit. Amen. Amen.